Good. I'm Jeff Moore. I have been with Independent Sector for a little over two years. Uh, came on board to help uh, the organization move through a strategic visioning process. And as I was thinking about the panel today and the, the role of the strategic planner, the strategy officer, and, and I'm guessing many of us have been in this position. You're at a cocktail party and somebody says, so what do you do? And you say, oh, I'm the strategy officer. And you get one of two reactions. Oh, that's awesome. You get to think about what should be. You don't have to worry so much about what is. Or you get the other reaction. Ugh. One of those. You're always thinking about what should be. What we really need to think about is what is. So this conversation is going to start to bring some of that together. It's about moving that through that gap of visioning into implementation. And as we uh, talked with the panel to prepare for this morning's presentation, we talked about a couple of questions that we'd like to focus in on uh, to sort of frame the conversation. I'm guessing that each of the panelists will touch on these points. Uh, as we move through the morning discussion, and then we can come back to them uh, in the period of uh, question and answer. So the first question for the panel and for you to be thinking about, is you, before you actually begin to think about moving into that implementation process, you're done with the visioning work, you're ready to start implementing, how, how do you assess whether or not you've actually got the right plan is your starting point the right starting point first? Second, as you've moved into execution, what kind of success factors are you setting for yourself, for your team, and for the organization to know that you're hitting the markers as you move and you're not just sort of wandering in the wilderness? So success factors. Third, though I'm sure that in each of your organizations the process has always gone without a hitch, um, but if you were to think about where this work can sometimes get off the rails, again, thinking about moving through that transition of strategy into vision, uh, from strategic vision into execution, where do we sometimes find ourselves getting off the rails? Third, fourth, we've all heard it said that culture eats strategy for lunch. So what are the cultural norms that you would suggest need to exist in your organization for a strategy to really take root and create change? And then finally, and this is really to the panelists, if you were to th think back on your work on a recent process and share with us one key lesson learned, what would that be? So five questions to frame. Turn first to Brooke, and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Um, so I'm Brooke McKean, and I have been COO with Heartland Alliance International for the past five years. Um, Heartland Alliance International, or HAI, is an international human rights organization based out of Chicago that provides programs and access to justice and trauma-informed mental health care to some of the world's most vulnerable populations. So a year ago, we launched a five-year strategic plan that had five key organizational objectives uh, around growth targets and impact, around programmatic goals and an aim to be the best employer in human rights. This plan was a result of a year-long collaborative process. It was launched at our annual retreat last June, and there was a lot of excitement about it. Everyone felt really good about it, and then they all went back home to their busy lives and their busy schedules, and then what? So we knew from experience working with other organizations that it's very easy to put a plan in place and then realize five years later that very little was accomplished. So we spent a lot of time doing research, 
uh, there's a lot of resources out there on strategic planning. We talk to other NGOs. We use resources through Inside NGO. And a list of those that we found most useful is on the last slide of this presentation, which you can download after the event. Um, and we kind of developed our own implementation plan and model for uh, implementation of our strategic plan. And we took, we went from the larger vision and narrowed it down to the country level. Uh, I will focus today on our work around operational planning and implementation and monitoring and evaluation. And we started by asking ourselves, what all do we need to do to achieve this strategic vision of ours to achieve the goals of our plan? Uh, we thought about what structures were needed. We thought about how do we know that we've actually succeeded. Um, and in busy lives and busy schedules of our staff across the organization, how can we ensure that they continue to work forward and achieve the goals of the plan? So in developing the operational plan, it ended up being an actual narrative document around 10 pages long that looked at questions around organizational structure. One of the visions of the plan was to be a decentralized organization. Uh, yet there were some staff who felt that should happen very quickly. There were others who were more hesitant about change. Uh, there was, wasn't really clarity around definitions. So we spent some time defining what it meant, laying out criteria for decentralization, and directly addressing a lot of the tensions that come up in organizational change. Change is hard for people, and it's important for us to acknowledge that and create a framework for staff to understand how and why decisions are being made. The operational plan also looked at operation systems. So it looked at the finance, HR, IT systems that would need to evolve and improve over the course of the next five years. Finally, the plan looked at our performance management process and how we could improve it. And that I'll talk about in a little more detail. So I provided here a few models that we developed in our operational plan. I'm not going to go into detail on these, but just to let you know that those who are interested are in a similar place in their organizational development, see how we adapted various tools to, to make decisions. Uh, at the level of measuring success, how did we know we achieved the goals of the plan? What were our indicators of success? So from the beginning, I said, less is more. We should have one to two priority indicators. And then our m &T &E team went out, and they got a lot of advice. They put together a list of activities and indicators. And as you can see from this image here, it was about 20 feet long and detailed fine print of over 100 indicators. <laughs> and way too much information for someone to process, let alone collect all that data. And so what we did to narrow is we categorized three types of indicators, those that we thought were important to measure uh, for our reporting processes, those that we defined as important because they needed to happen in the first one to three years. They had to come first for us to be successful. Uh, we also defined those highest risk issues that needed to come early along in the plan. We also developed one to two indicators per our five strategic objectives that actually measured change. So we could go to our board of directors and our executive director and say, we know we've become a better place to work in human rights because we've seen this change over the last five years. That was then broken into a detailed m and &E plan. It looks a lot like a project m and &E plan that clearly lays out roles and responsibilities by department and individual in implementing these key indicators that we defined. That then rolled up into a new quarterly report process, uh, which we roll out and share with our senior leaders. And it's a trigger for us to know when and how our plan is being implemented. Are we behind or on track with our goals? Uh, an opportunity to course correct if we are getting behind. Around performance management. So we thought it was important for all staff across the organization to have some identity with the strategic plan, for them to feel that they were connected to the goals of the plan and see their role in it. And also recognize that people have busy lives and need to come back to the goal. So we did two things. One, we revised our performance management process. We defined a new tool that was connected directly to the goals of the plan. Uh, we also developed core competencies. And those core competencies are things like leadership skills, management, change management, reliability, professionalism. We, met, we developed a really long list and we sent it out to leadership across the organization and had them vote and rank those competencies based on what they thought was necessary to be successful at HAI. We also had them rank it based on what they thought was necessary for us to achieve the goals of our strategic plan. We then narrowed that down to 10 core competencies 
which was integrated into our performance management tools. Uh, we also took those competencies and defined them by employee type. So the way a senior manager is involved in change management is different than a field staff member, and we took the time to define that. We then put those competencies in the actual annual review form. So now all staff have to assess and their supervisors assess their strengths and weaknesses across these 10 core competencies. Um, it's also what we haven't done yet, but what I hope to do next is to identify those competencies where we have less strength um, and use that to inform our recruitment strategy. So some lessons learned. Um, so as I said, and I still believe less is more, but what I learned is that sometimes you have to start with more and narrow down. And that process of defining all these many things that needed to happen and prioritizing among them was a really good exercise for the team. Uh, one of the things that helped in narrowing with colleagues was thinking through one big coal per person per quarter. Um, another lesson, unsurprisingly, is that strategic planning feels like a job on top of an already busy job. Uh, we had hired an external consultant to help us with developing the plan and the strategy, but not the implementation stage. And in retrospect, I think we would have had some, some more support to streamline our processes. I also felt that the core competency process was extremely useful. It feels very abstract to people what these are, what it means, but it helped to very quickly understand which staff were excelling in this new and changing environment and those that were struggling. Um, another lesson, my probably biggest lesson learned in this was the importance of going back to the vision. This process was filling out report forms, processes, procedures, very detailed things that, that felt very overwhelming to people. Um, and so going back to the goals and the vision of the plan, something that everybody agreed on, and emphasizing why these details were important to helping us succeed in our goals was an important lesson. And finally, integrate everywhere. Um, we didn't create a new reporting process, we revised our existing one. We didn't create new performance management tools, we revised the existing ones. Uh, so we worked to ensure that um, the systems that we had were being approved upon and not creating extra levels of work for the staff and colleagues. Um, so this is, I could say a whole lot more about this. There's a lot more that we did, but see, these are some of the highlights. Um, if there are other organizations in a similar state or similar process, I'm always willing and interested in talking and hearing about challenges that you're facing um, and talking through ours as well. So um, feel free to reach out at any point, um, and thank you. Good morning. I'm, I'm Wellington Pack with FHI 360. I don't have any slides. Um, what I wanted to do this morning is to just share some very simple observations, uh, learn the hard way uh, within our context, and, uh, and then to leave some room for discussion. So uh, I'm the director of, of strategy and innovation. What that means in our context at FHI 360 is that I drive our strategic planning, and I drive our innovation agenda, and all the the analytics that support both. And uh, just to uh, give you a, a, a bit of a thumbnail of FHI 360 to give you a sense of what we deal with, uh, we're an international NGO uh, with a decent scale, about 4,500 folks uh, in 70 countries. We've got a multi-sectoral uh, portfolio, which means that though we started in, um, in health, uh, we have over the years expanded into both uh, uh, education and economic development and sort of everything in between. So we've got a pretty wide portfolio of things which makes it both uh, interesting and difficult from a, a strategy guy's perspective. And uh, this morning, what I wanted to share, uh, just really three, three things. Number one, uh, the question that, that Jeff teed up in terms of, you know, what, how do you know that our strategy, or that your strategy is working? And I'll just conflate that with the second question, which is how do you, you know, what are some of the key success factors, if you will? And, you know, as executives, we all think of um, the, the well, I would submit the, the, the the secret in the room, right, which is you, you don't really know. You don't really know that a strategy is working until you start to see outcomes, right? You start to see material impact in your markets. Um, and, uh, and of course, you, you have the right metrics in place to, to look at the throughput and activities and, and all the robust things that my colleague just put up there. Um, I would love to get to that point. Um, we have a simple dashboard. We have some metrics that, that track activity along the way. But for us, anyway, to my mind, it's hard to actually think about um, it, whether it's working 
uh, in truth until you actually start to see results. And again, as executives, we want to see sort of low-hanging fruit. What's missed, I would submit, is that, um, and this is the indicator, and this is what I think is, is the, um, the thing that we all should be um, paying a bit more attention to as, as uh, organizations. And that is a strategy, the, the point of strategy in my mind is to build, uh, yes, this awesome strategy of, of how to expand, how to grow, and so on. But it's also to build a shared understanding among senior leadership. And what I mean by that, what I mean by shared understanding is that everyone has the same grid. Everyone in, um, and not just the, the C-suite, not just the senior leadership, but really within that strategy ecosystem. And that's something that I've endeavored to build over um, this past year in particular, that, uh, that all the folks who make those tactical and strategic dec decisions need to be on the same page. And that shared understanding really comes from uh, a number of things. First, it comes from figuring out what do we mean by strategy? And based on where you come from, you bring a, a different set of lens. And, and that's something that in our context, we simply just have to clarify. Uh, you know, is strategy a revenue target, a top line, a growth number? Is it a portfolio target? We've got to diversify our funding in, the, you know, in this way. Is it a BHAG? Is it a bold goal with some kind of mission uh, vision that just sits under the, the mission and vision but above the strategy? What, what is strategy? And in our context, it's all of the above. And it's also... Um, so I'll get into what we mean by it, but it's, it's worth defining what your leadership means and thinks about when you think of strategy. And so that's number one, just, you know, duh, you know, what is it in our context? And for us, um, it really is what we consider a policy, if you will. It's, and, and for us, and I don't want to get too deep into it, but, but it's comprised of three things. One is a, a healthy, healthily skeptical diagnosis of your main strategic problem. And many of us don't think about it in terms of a problem. We just think about it in terms of growth. I'm talking about it in our context. And it's important to think about, get everyone on the same page about what is a central strategic problem that your organization is facing. You know, for example, is it a matter of, is it framed as a competitive challenge? And coming from the commercial world, looking into uh, uh, international development for a number of years, um, you know, I, I bring that, I, that particular lens. That's part of it. It's what is that competitive challenge? The framing could also be, what is our, 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 um, our sense of mission? Mission relevance. Is it eroding? Is it expanding? And, and for us, it's actually both. But the central strategic problem is so important in terms of building that shared understanding of how to actually go about strategy, and more importantly for today, of course, operationalizing it. The second thing, so that's that healthy skepticism. Do we really have, you know, to, to use the, the, the business lens, competitive advantage? Do we really, or are we just at competitive parity? To use the mission lens, are we really relevant as much as we thought we were 10 years ago? Things have changed. Do we have a play in some of these disruptive things going on, whether it's social impact investment, social enterprise, you name it. Do we have a play? Are we becoming more relevant or less with regards to our mission? The second thing, so that's uh, in terms of, of having a good strategy in our context, what we mean by that is um, a healthily skeptical view, a diagnosis of our, of our actual problem, strategic problem. Number two, it's, it's actually having a policy, and this is where most of the, the stuff, if you will, uh, exists. The policy uh, with a lowercase p, I guess, we're all around the beltway, I don't mean a policy as like a, a governmental mandate. It's really a, a, a grid. It's a way to say, our actions, our, our thinking, our trade-offs, because, of course, strategy is, is saying yes to things and no to things. And so what does that look like, the set of policies that, in a coherent, logical way, put these pieces together? And the third thing is actually having those actions, having a plan, having a set of priorities that drive into operations. And so in that context of having a, a sense of a shared understanding is, I think, in my mind, one of the key success uh, predictors, if you will, if you've got that early on and you can sense that everyone's on the same page, not conformity in, in terms of thinking that, you know, my ideas are, are shared across the board, but at least sharing the same assumptions about what our competitive uh, challenge is, what our, our mission challenge is, and being on the same page and being able to, to pivot. I'll give you an example. Uh, about five years ago, FHI, um, then FHI, not FHI 360, uh, made a, a fairly large acquisition. And in our NGO space, M&A is, is not uh, too prevalent. Uh, we see it here and there. Uh, but we were able to, the organization was able to move pretty quickly. And that's what got us into the education and social economic development space. But that particular transaction, that strategic move, which of course comes with a bunch of uh, operational things that, that, hook, that hang off that, 
That was preceded by a number of years of the shared understanding that I'm talking about. Because had that not been, uh, had that groundwork not been laid, that would have never have happened so quickly. And I would, I would submit that it would not have happened at all because the opportunity would have been lost. And as you know, for, for those of you um, executives who are in M&A, who deal with that, you need a strategic grid on one hand, on the, on, on the other hand, it's, it's highly opportunistic. And so having that shared understanding is so important. We were able to do it because a few years in advance, everyone was on the same page about what is our key problem. The second observation that I wanted to make was really around culture. Um, I love the quote from Peter Drucker, uh, the way I understand it. Uh, actually, we have a running joke within, within our leadership, which goes like this. Uh, if culture eats strategy uh, for breakfast, or, or lunch, as it were, uh, what then does it eat for a full dinner? You know, in other words, which is to say, look, culture is just so powerful. You can have this airtight, bulletproof, whatever strategy. You paid millions of do dollars for, hope hopefully not. Uh, getting some consultants and so on. And I used to do that for a living uh, on, from a consulting perspective. I didn't make millions of dollars, but anyway, I helped organizations do that. And you can have that, you know, uh, airtight, bulletproof strategy, but if your culture does not support it, it will derail it altogether. It can be a great enabler and it can be a great inhibitor. And so, you know, what, what does it eat for a full dinner? I mean, spouses and children? I mean, what it, what, it, what it does eat for dinner, so to speak, culture, is actually all the things within, a cult, within your cultural architecture. And that's the one thing that I want to just offer in this dialogue. That in our context, anyway, I've heard many folks talk about culture like it's carbon monoxide. You can't see it, you can't smell it, but boy, it's toxic and it's killing people, right? And which may not be your case, but, and it's not always uh, you know, our, our case uh, at, at home either. But the point is that it's, that's not a very useful uh, diagnosis. And I think as folks who are interested in taking strategy and driving it into operations with efficiency and effectiveness, it's useful to think about culture in terms of a cultural architecture. Uh, meaning that if you were to lift open the hood, there's an architecture like there is in, in a, a business architecture or, or, a, or a building architecture. There's both a formal and an informal set of things. There's, there's structure, the org structure, there's decision rights, how decisions really get made. There's uh, information flow, does everything go up, does nothing come down from Mount Olympus and that, and that sort of thing. Motivators, aligning it with how people behave and act. And so all these things are important in diagnosing the culture in which our strategy operates. And is, and is in fact operationalized. And so for example, um, if you have, uh, back to the, the healthily skeptical diagnosis of, of our own organization, if you realize, if we realize that our culture is, that our uh, organizational culture is one that is, uh, let a thousand flowers bloom. On one hand, it's, it's uh, highly entrepreneurial in spirit and we, and we harness the best of that, but it scorns everything that comes from the top. Well, there's a challenge there. There's a very big challenge, and as, as you scale, that can get you. In fact, I would argue that that gets you to a certain scale, and you need that, but at a certain level, when you're big enough or you're too big, uh, it becomes difficult, and it actually becomes a liability in some cases more than an asset. On the other hand, let's say your culture, your, corporate, uh, your, your organizational culture is more um, top-down. It's, it's the classic command control. Certainly e efficient, maybe more effective, but boy, does it really snuff out innovation. And so I, I mention this because uh, having a, a diagnosis of the actual cultural architecture of your organization and then to really zero in on the key aspects will change and enable how you actually go about your, your implementation. So with that, I'll, I'll close. Um, the, the one last thing that, if you give me 10 seconds, I, I would say the one key thing, lesson learned for me and in our context is to have really strong leadership that takes uh, the organization from uh, strategy formulation, figuring out what that is, all the way through building the ecosystem and into driving it into a kind of operations model and making sure that that tethering happens. And that strong leadership is important, not just from the top, but throughout the organization. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, it's a privilege for me to be here with this panel uh, because these are men and women who are every day translating strategy into operations. And I also want to applaud and express my own appreciation for all of you. You know, it's not easy to, uh, whether it's 
from the visionary perspective or the implementation perspective is to really be that behind the scenes supporting an organization realize its mission and vision. Uh, and it takes a certain kind of individual to care enough about that and about how that connects to their own sense of value and contribution. So I want to thank all of you for what you do every day. For me, uh, as I thought about this, because I know you've got some real experts on this panel, uh, and, and it's going to be anchored by Carlos, who's guiding this ship with Save the Children and their efforts with strategic planning. And of course, the other NGOs are also uh, best of class in what they're doing. But I wanted to, first of all, just share with you, when I think about the strategic fit, so this fit between strategy and operations, this very important nexus, because if you get either one wrong, then you really don't have a strategic plan, do you? Uh, when I think about it, I think of it as kind of the is it real test. And in my, you know, kind of uh, simplistic approach, I think about kind of five factors or a five-part is test. First of all, is it a story you can tell? A story you can tell. And for me, that means not just the organization, but for you personally. How do you make sure that you think about that strategy as a story of self, where you come from, and your connection to the organization, and the organization's connection to its mission, its cause, its theory of change. Because if we don't connect our own story to the strategy at hand, to the organization, to what we care about, then it doesn't become real. You know, for me, I was um, a child of an abused mother, and we escaped, and uh, she married uh, an African-American black Baptist minister, and we were then had a custody battle. Uh, I was taken away from her. I then escaped so I could run back to her across the country. Um, in fact, part of, our, part of our journey meant that we had to leave the country. And in all of that, it was the people around me that helped me choose the positive in life rather than the anger. And we see in this world, especially in these very difficult times that we face, that so many youth around the world have to make that choice. So for me, connecting to Global Impact's mission, a 60-year-old organization that's all about growing global philanthropy and making sure that there's resources for all of you on the front lines supporting those children, that gets me to work every day. And it gets me around our mission and vision of building partnerships and resources. And I think what you've got to do is say, what are, what are each and every one of our own personal stories and the organization's story and, indeed, the story of your strategic plan? So I really encourage you, can you tell the story? Is the story real? The second is, for me, is alignment. How do you make sure that there's alignment between your mission, vision, your strategy, and your annual planning and all the things that are happening, whether it's with individual programs or whether it's with you know, functional groups. Because that alignment, and it's very difficult, but that alignment is so important because if you can't get that alignment, then it'll be disruptive to the strategy and disruptive to the operations. The third is, is it measurable? And often we think about that in you know, very quantifiable metrics. But I think we have to think about it in non-quantifiable metrics. So whether it's advocacy objectives, or whether it's uh, you know, revenue objectives, or programmatic objectives, you want to make sure that you can measure it, even if it doesn't have a number. There's got to be a way that you're going to measure the visibility, measure the advocacy, the change. Because if you have that, then everyone who comes to that table to talk about how they're doing on their plans and on their strategy and how they're operationalizing has something to share. And you're all able to see those measurable results, even if they're not quantifiable but you agree on those forms of measurement. The fourth area for me is kind of, is it a campaign you can sell? So this is the fundraiser in me. Because ultimately, if you have a plan that has to be operationalized and you've got to raise multiple millions of dollars for it, right? That's a tough plan to get off the ground. That's a tough, tough ship to sail. So you want to, as you go along, uh, as you build that story, as you create the alignment, you want to make sure you've got enough ownership by other stakeholders and by both internal and external drivers that you can sell this plan. And it's not a hard, it's not a hard sell. It's a campaign. It becomes, indeed, uh, the campaign 
is about your strategic plan. You don't have to create something different. You might brand it differently, but you know what you're selling. And finally, is it a plan that makes the world better? Because after all, in the end, that's what connects all of us, right? To our plans and to our organizations. So those, those are kind of my, my, my thoughts about how you, you know, could at least could kind of get a sense of the fit between strategy and operations of that strategy. Just a couple of other comments about some of the other important questions that Jeff has raised for us. When you move into execution, what are the success factors that you look for? And I think the one that's really resonated for me in the implementation of our new strategic, I would say, framework um, has been kind of threefold. One is to have not as much a uh, precise, defined, uh, you know, mechanistic plan, but rather have a framework. Have a framework that allows for creativity, but still has that alignment, that measurement, you know, sense of purpose. Um, but, you know, don't, don't oversubscribe, uh, but have a framework versus a plan. Secondly is come together. Make sure you've got a community around this plan. Because if you just go off and then, you know, once a year check in with each other, it's not going to work. You've got to have the plan be as much about bringing the community of your organization together as anything else you do. Uh, whether that's quarterly or monthly or annually, it doesn't really matter, right? But you've just got to create that sense of uh, not only discipline, but kind of desire to get together, desire to share those scorecards, because that's where that's going to be that interaction. People are going to be celebrated. They're going to be encouraged. They're going to be challenged. But you want to build a sense of community. And then finally, I think it's important, of course, to build a sense of accountability. So for me, I think success factors can have a lot about the framework, you know, the community, and the accountability. You know, in terms of... Um, things that can go wrong. Um, you know, I think, um, I think the two biggest things that um, I have found can go wrong, uh, one of them is you can often kind of very quickly disconnect the annual plans from the strategic plan. So in an effort to give flexibility, in an effort to let people run, you know, with what you have, particularly if you haven't oversubscribed the plan, um, you can end up with annual plans that, you know, get offset from that alignment. And then secondly is to not be afraid of failure because uh, you, don't want, you don't want your teams to feel in any way, shape, or form that um, they have to be so subscribed that if they come up with a new idea, you want it to be aligned, right? That's kind of the first, the first uh, uh, concern or, or, or certainly barrier I found. But you also don't want them to be inhibited. And finally, uh, you know, how do you really make sure that uh, culture is a part of all this? And I would say, for me, it's about all constantly doing, as part of your strategic checkpoint, connecting to mission. You know, whether it's your personal stories, whether it's the story of what one organization is doing in their strategic plan process, or whether it's some of your stakeholders, but the more that you can allow your teams to connect a mission in the implementation of a strategic plan rather than something on the side, I think the more you can keep culture at least uh, you know, uh, front and center. It may look different, uh, as Wellington mentioned, it's you know, lots of different kinds of culture, but connecting to mission allows all of us to kind of place our cultural divides, our territorial interests, and kind of keep ourselves focused on the, on the strategy. Thanks. First, I want to um, thank everyone um, for coming to our session. And I want to thank Jeff for taking the time to organize this panel, and for sure want to thank Susan and Inside NGO for putting such a fantastic conference one more year. You keep doing it year after year, so a round of applause for you. Thank you. That is, here you go. oh, great, right here. perfect, thank you. So a, a few thoughts um, 
from, from my perspective working at Save the Children over the four, last four years, which I've seen the execution of one cycle of our strategy, and we're now starting our, our, our new strategy over the next 15 years. Just to give you some background, for the first time in our history, and we're getting ready to celebrate 100 years at Save, um, all the members, um, operate, 30 members operating in 120 countries, we came together under one global strategy, quite the task. That took a huge amount of time, resources, energy, um, a lot of time harmonizing, aligning, you can imagine, different views from different members all over the world. But I think that's a key lesson learned because we came up in a good place. Let me show you quickly our framework. So that is where we came up. Three breakthroughs, that's what we want to do for children by 2030, focusing on surviving. Our children, no child dies of preventable diseases before they reach their fifth year. On learning, every child attains a quality basic education and no violence. Violence is not allowed. We would not um, entertain violence for children around the world. So those are our three breakthroughs. So everything we are doing at Save the Children, and we're quite multi-sectoral, similar to FSI. We work domestically, internationally, in 120 countries. We do humanitarian, we do development. Everything we do goes through those three breakthroughs. It was not easy getting there, but I think the time and the energy put together was, was key. So, so you, to, your, to your first question, Jeff. One new thing of our strategy is focusing on the most deprived and the most marginalized children. That can be as easy as focusing on girls or children that are marginalized because of their ethnicity or simply because of where they live, so hard to reach. So everything we're going to be doing over the next 15 years will be focusing on that. That doesn't mean we're not going to be trying to achieve impact at scale, but we really want to make sure that no child left behind. It's left behind. Then we organize our framework around four main pillars, around results, both programmatic and policy, around knowledge, around what we call being truly global, which is our staff, as well as being a high-performing organization, and a movement of millions. That's nothing else but mobilizing and motivating Americans behind our costs, which is mostly about fundraising, about branding, and about our efforts in digital. So you see eight strategies under the four pillars. Those are the Save the Children U.S. strategy. So there is enough flexibility, to Scott's point, on this framework for different members and country office throughout the world to adapt the framework to what they need to be doing. So some members are much more advanced in digital or in fundraising. Some are much stronger when it comes to programmatic work or advocacy work. So to achieve our ambition over the next 15 years, each of us will be focusing in different areas. So we just finished our three-year strategy, starting a new one. What are some of the key elements from my perspective? First, like I said, it's that commitment to the common goals. We no longer have discussions about doing global climate or getting involved in, envi in environmental work. We did that. For a year and a half, we have, we, we, we're 25,000 employees around the world. We have every idea you can think of about what Save the Children should be doing. So now we have, we're focused. We're much more aligned behind these common goals. The second one is having the right key metrics and the right indicators. Being a large organization, you can imagine how many dashboards we have. We even have a dashboard for our celebrities. So we have dashboards everywhere. So picking, taking out the key performance indicators that are going to help you measure if you're achieving your plan. And that's what you're going to focus over and over and over again. The other one is share ownership. I think all of us are, are working in an environment of ma a matrix organizations or what we call in the Save the Children network leadership. For us, that's important, but individual accountability is also very important for us. We make sure that each senior leadership team member, the next level down, they're all owning the old part of the strategy and that they're reporting on it. So having that balance between share accountability and individual accountability, it's very important for us. Um, I'll talk a, a little bit about regular um, touch points. It, for us, it's very important to keep talking about our strategy over and over. And last, corrective actions when targets are at risk. I think that's our biggest lesson learned from our last strategy. We knew some of the areas were not going as we wanted. 
For example, fundraising, some of our campaigns, we were not fast enough in making those tough decisions, realigning resources, realigning funding. It's, it takes time because you're always very hopeful that things will get better. So as a senior leadership team, we had that painful lesson that there's a lot we could have been, that could have happened much faster if we would have taken action much quicker. Hopefully that won't be the case in our new strategy going forward. So we have a lot of tools, a lot of tools to save the children. We are blessed with the support we get from the Boston Consulting Group. So they have been um, instrumental in helping us, BCG, with the, the design of our strategy. So happy to share. Um, afterwards, you, you, you can reach me through Susan or, or stop by. We have multiple tools at all levels that are very beneficial um, and have been very helpful um, for us. I think the key messages when it comes to tools is make sure you align your meetings. Let it be an all staff meeting or a board meeting. Align those meetings to your strategy. That's the way you're gonna keep that strategy alive. Every time you have a presentation, every time you have a senior management team meeting, you have an expanded senior management team meeting, make sure that it's all around your strategy. That's, you're gonna keep it there. It's gonna be up front, and you're gonna be reminding everyone we have three breakthroughs, we wanna reach the most marginalized, and this is how we're gonna get there. This is a quick snapshot of our benchmark. It's, it's two pages, I'm not gonna go through it, of course. Uh, but it gives you an idea. It's, it's aligned around our four pillars. It's, it's both quantitative and qualitative. It's both on people, on financials, on programs. This is the second page. We measure from our work in our country offices to our work in digital, attracting social media supporter, our fundraising. These are just a key indicators that we've taken out from the multiple dashboards that we have at the agency. This is what we do um, when we report to our board quarterly, and this is what we use for our senior management teams to make sure we are focusing on those key indicators that are gonna help us achieve our plan. On management challenges, um, I think for Save the Children, potentially similar to FHI and other organizations that are multi-sectorial, it's very hard to measure impact. So we reached 150 million children last year, so what? How are we gonna measure impact? And we continue to struggle with that. Um, we have a lot of pressure from our board of directors to really figure that out. Um, it's hard, because a lot of our funding, like I assume um, for many of you here, is restricted, it comes from grants. So it's, it's easier to, to, to have a baseline and monitor a grant, not as easy to monitor your organization. Are you really making a difference for those you are serving? So that is something that it's, um, it's an ongoing challenge for us. Um, the other one is aligning priorities and investments. This is tough, this is resource allocation. Um, save the children, we, we have some unrestricted funding, but definitely not as much as as we need, I was just having that conversation with, with, with Scott and Global Impact is gonna help us get there. Um, it's, it's hard, it's hard when you wanna reach the most marginalized, it's hard when you wanna stay independent and really true to your mission to really allocate those fund, the, the, those, those precious funds, I call them gold, the, the gold nuggets, the unrestricted. So that is a key challenge for us because there are multiple priorities. And the last one is celebrating incremental improvement. For, we all face with the concept of transformational change, right? We're all concerned about how do we re-engineer ourselves for the next 10 years, I mean, save the children, for the next 100 years, are we still relevant as an international NGO? So we're all looking at transformational change, but for us, it's been a challenge, but we need to get there. We need to celebrate the incremental improvement. Slowly make sure staff sees where we are going and they can celebrate one step at a time some of the achievement um, of the strategy. In terms of key, um, I will say if there's a key thing that I will focus on that I've learned this last three years and, and in previous organizations, is to align your two-year cycle or your three-year cycle, whatever your cycle is and your strategy, make sure that's aligned to your long-term vision. 
Make sure you stay true to that. Make sure that is your compass. Um, I've seen a lot of three-year cycles of strategy <clears throat> that are very successful, but when you put them together, did you achieve where you want it to be 10 to 15 years from now? In terms of culture, I see cultures, culture, I see it two ways. What you can see, your mission, your vision, your values, your strategy, and the stuff that, and the things that you cannot see. The norms, your tradition, the um, unwritten rules. And when you combine those two, those are the behaviors that we see from our employees, from our staff, from ourselves, that we think that's what's being rewarded and that's what we should be doing. My advice is, what, is to really focus on those unwritten rules, those things that you cannot see in your culture, and tackle them. Because I completely agree that they can destroy your strategy. In the case of Ch Save the Children, four years ago, we realized that we had been doing the same thing over and over for so long. And it was so hard to think of continuous improvement. So we had this huge initiative with the support of CROX on Six Sigma. And really, tra we trained hundreds of our staff in Six Sigma and really pushing the concept of continuous improvement, getting efficiencies out of the system so we could realign that, those funds, into other parts of our strategy. In our new strategy going forward, we got to go beyond continuous improvement. And we've noticed, as I'm sure you see in your, with, with all of us, our resistance to change. Save the Children is changing fast, the way we operate, the way we interact with each other, the world around us is changing so fast. So we have a huge initiative now on change management. And really, hope, we hope to train thousands of staff on skills on how to cope with change and how to make it real with them. So look at those areas in your culture that you see will be a barrier for your strategy and right away try to, tar try, try to tackle them um, as fast as you can. So with that, thank you for your time. I'm going to turn the panel back over to Jeff Moore, um, but I just wanted to mention if, if we have time, I know we're running close in, if we have time at the end for Q&A beyond um, Jeff's questions to the panel, if you would just come up to the microphone um, that we will pass, um, and also just if you would mention your organization so it can ground that for the room. And do be sure at the end of the session to fill out your evaluations. They're in the, your notebooks and also on the app. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you to the panel. I want to make sure that there is, in fact, time for folks in the audience to ask questions. So I only have one question. Um, and Scott and Carlos both touched on this. To some degree, you all did. Um, in the independent sector experience, we, we talked about a strategic visioning exercise quite intentionally so that we could release ourselves from that pressure of thinking in terms of three to five year plan in fact, it seemed to us that less and less frequently were people thinking in terms of three to five strategic, strategic plans. Um, so we wanted to look 15, 20 years out, get a sense of where the sector was going. We took almost nine months to, to really think that through, examine a series of trends that were shaping our operating environment. And then we will operationalize through annual operational plans. So this question of alignment, I'm, I'm interested in understanding what specific tools or methods you use to make sure that against that clarion call of your vision, that the plans that you're bringing forward, you know, an annual plan or maybe it's a three-year plan, that there is that alignment. How are you helping staff think that through? How are you managing from you know, top-down perspective. What kind of tools, what's the experience? One, one tool that we use at, at Save the Children that w when I joined four years ago, I thought it was a bit much and over the top, but it really works. It's the concept of gold trees, and I'm sure you, you've heard of this. And if not, if it's not a gold tree, there are other models out there. So every divisional plan, it's totally linked to our strategy very simple tool. 
So every time we meet quarterly as a senior manager, as expanded senior management meeting, we're thinking of those goal trees. We're thinking about how those divisions are achieving their goals. And that's how we bring it all up. It's, it's an exercise that helps us with our planning year after year. Yes, uh, similar, uh, we use um, scorecards, which are informed by annual goal setting um, as a way to continually look at how we're gonna measure any given department or team or integrated team against kind of the broader plan and vision. Um, but the second thing is that we do an annual landscape of the marketplace. So when I think about the amazing work the independent sector did in the nine factors of our environment and, and many of the other things that you did in that landscaping, we do a miniature version of that um, every year so that we give staff as well as the organization a sense to say, in our you know, 10, 15 year you know, theory of change, is there, are there dramatic disruptions that we need to be accounting for? So that kind of annual landscape is something everybody gets to be a part of. Um, and then finally, I think the um, other thing that we do is that we um, are constantly making sure that staff have oper other outlets like product development or innovation so that they don't feel like their plans and their, their connection to the strategy is the only thing they do. You know, so there's some, some room for innovation. Thanks. Wellington or Pat or Brooke, anything you want to add? I mean, the only thing I would add is that we've architected a process that um, enables us to, to look at what we call growth horizons. And that gets to that middle space of, of what, we, what we would call a bold goal, that, that vision of, of 10, 15 years out, and that annual alignment. And so when we have uh, both a bottom-up perspective first uh, and, and sub, you know, in a subsequent phase, a top-down look, in that bottom-up approach, we want to engage all the right stakeholders throughout the organization. And so we, we provide a, a framework that, that enables folks to think about not just the next year and how to grow and all that, but it give, gives folks um, a framework, th these growth horizons, a way to be thinking about how do we think from a bottom-up perspective, how do we think we align with where the organization is going. And then we, we uh, vet that with a, with a top-down view. Sure. So we're actually right about to implement year two, so I don't have as clear of a strategy as these other organizations. But one thing that we did do in, in our first stages of implementation was an all-staff survey uh, that mm -hmm. connected staff back to the overall goals and mission and, and helped us collect some initial data. Uh, and we had 100% participation, uh, which was hugely exciting. Uh, and that's something that I now want to do annually as an opportunity to, to report back uh, and continue to collect that information and connect staff back to the mission. Questions from the audience, please. If you would, if you have a thought, ah, okay. If you'd like to direct your question in a particular way, just please indicate that. And also please be sure to tell us who you are. Great, thank you. Peg Ross, PCI, um, Head of Global HR NOD. Um, perhaps this is um, for Carlos, although I'd be interested in others. Um, I'm interested in how the, the mechanism, the methodology by which you consider investment priorities within the strategic plan, how do you get your arms around that? Thanks. Yeah, that, that is the, the, the toughest part. Um, for us, we look at our sources of funds, the designated, the restricted, the unrestricted, um, and we look at the uses of funds, those are going to be funded by grants, and that those initiatives that need to be funded by what we call undesignated, which is your cost recovery from your grants, your overhead, plus your, plus your unrestricted. So there goes the, the allocation. We have a few senior management team meetings in anticipation of the budget year where everyone presents their case and about what initiatives they're going to be conducting and what do they want to move forward and how aligned it is with the strategy. So out of our eight strategies at Save the Children, there are two key strategies for us. One is raising unrestricted. The, the, the bigger we get with grants, it makes it very hard for us to stay independent and to achieve that mission, the most children, the most deprived. So raising unrestricted 
is the number one goal for us. So a lot of our investments automatically will go there. That doesn't mean we're not going to be pursuing USAID, Global Fund, but the balance of the allocation has shifted over the last three years to get there. The other one is becoming a high-performing organization, investing in systems, investing in our financial systems, in our HR systems, strengthening our country offices, those platforms. So a lot of our investments will also go there. That doesn't mean we're not gonna focus on the rest. So we have that lens within our A priorities. What are the two key priorities? That has helped us with the allocation of resources. But it's stressful. It's hard to keep your, your senior team, your, your, your staff overall motivated, committed, when you cannot really invest as much as you want in the fantastic ideas, the innovation that is out, out there. That's why we need to raise the unrestricted. Other responses from the panel? I think the notion of uh, bringing people together around the investments and decision making and you can't include everybody but some process that everybody feels that like they're getting heard is a really a really great best practice. Brooke, did you have something to add? So we actually we actually just went through this process with our fiscal year budgeting exercise and we broke it down into three categories. Similar to Carlos, first was targets around growth and how we would want to invest in that. Uh, the second was quality needs, so what was our areas to improve overall program and technical quality, and the third was risk. What are the highest organizational risks and liabilities? So that's how we framed our organizational investments. Thank you. Yeah, no, Scott. You know, one of the things that can help you externally with your investments is, uh, particularly as Brooke uh, commented her categories, those are kind of ideally, ideal categories to position externally as well. So the use of unrestricted money, it's hard to sell overhead, hard to sell a system, right? So the more you can sell it as a strategic initiative, as growth, as uh, you know, uh, a, a new innovative idea uh, of getting ahead of the curve, those are things that you can report on um, and still you know, invest in systems, invest in people, you know, so it's important to think about, again, what's that campaign externally, yeah. Thank you. Another question, we've got, we've got a couple of minutes, can probably take one more. Anyone, oh, please. There's a mic coming. And we also just rolled out a five-year global strategy that will be implemented, hopefully, in 2020. And I think that we're struggling to get significant adoption at the country level within the field. And it'd be um, useful to understand two things, which I think are our greatest challenges, which is that culture shift. And I think it's great that SAVE has created this change management um, program. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about what that looks like. Um, and the second, a lot of you have said, um, you know, over-communicate. And we're struggling with what is the best way to communicate to make sure that um, it is relevant to our field staff um, without being too much. Who would like to start? Wellington. So the, the way that um, I would come at that and, and just to uh, cite some examples in our context is that um, with, with regard to communication, there's uh, in our ecosystem, if you will, there's um, folks who are stakeholders who have material input, you know, from whom we want to engage in a formal process. And so what we do, we don't do this every year because it's pretty expensive, but we, every several years we have something called uh, the, the Global Leadership Summit. And we bring um, about 120 of the, of the senior most staff, from, largely from overseas, you know, to, to the states. And we have uh, a full week of, of planning, of leadership development, lots of communication, lots of excitement around our, our bold vision. That, but that's really at the, at the top level. Um, what we do also uh, with, uh, within the entire organization, and it's not exactly uh, a, a, part of, a formal part of the strike planning, but it's a piece to actually get that engagement, is that we have this little modest innovation fund, we call it Catalyst. And it's, it's a seed, it's, it almost works like an internal uh, early stage seed fund, and we have a little bit of unrestricted that we can do that with. 
but it's a way to engage folks and say, in, in your programmatic technical areas um, where the innovation resides, kick up the, the best ideas. And those of you who, are, who have a little bit of uh, a social uh, entrepreneurialism in your blood, kick those ideas up and we incubate those internally and we try to get those to scale. And so that's a way, not only uh, a way to you know, piece it into the strategy, but also a way to communicate in doing that, communicate the broader goal of what we're trying to do, uh, strategic growth, innovation in our case, and so on. Carlos, did you want to come back to the change management? Yeah, I, I think for Save the Children, the biggest challenge we have is we have a lot of excitement in the different headquarters and the members around the world. And when it comes to implementing our work in the country offices, we're getting huge resistance. We're very similar to IRC, so I, I, I feel I have a lot of empathy for, for your challenges because um, ours are, 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 are it's tough. Uh, I have a few of my colleagues from SAFE here who, who directly interact with the country offices. And there's a lot of pushback. There's a lot of pushback about potentially a disconnect between the strategy and our ambition in Washington and in London and in Connecticut versus what's really happening in the field and what the reality is. And I think it's somewhere in the middle. So our, our change management initiative, we're calling it ADI, is Accelerating Delivery and Improvement, brings three disciplines together. One is continuous improvement, incremental change, it's more rigorous. Think about projects in finance and projects in HR. The other one is change management. How are we gonna cope with change? And we have different modules that we're gonna be training and start for sure with our country offices, our large country offices. How to cope with all the new initiatives coming from the headquarters going their way. And the third one is project management. We painfully realize is not one of our strengths. So combining those three areas, continuous improvement, change management, and project management into this new initiative, it's allowed us to interact in a much healthier way with our country offices. They know we hear them, we have empathy, we don't have a solution, but at least we want to spend funds and resources getting them there, getting them ready to absorb all the change that's coming from all of us and from the environment um, around us. I'll be happy to talk to you more about that. We have been lucky to have corporate partners to support us with those efforts, um, especially on the trainings from GlaxoSmithKline, BCG, Accenture, and so forth. So that has been very helpful too. Um, to have those corporate partners for those initiatives. Thank you, Carlos. I think that we are at time, so I first want to thank Inside NGO for recognizing in this, the content of this panel, that there really is a vulnerability in that, that place between strategy, vision, and implementation, and this is a panel that I think has helped us shed a little bit of light on how we make that jump and make it successfully. So thank you to Inside NGO, thank you to the panel, thank you to all of you for hanging in there as what appears to have been a wonderful conference begins to, to wind down. So thank you, thank you once and all. Thanks. Thank you.